All right, hey everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Redistricting Radar. Uh, I'm Eric Cunningham. Uh, Harrison will be on with us later, and also right now we've got Ar Ar Armin Thomas as well. Uh, this week we're going over an interesting state, which is uh, Indiana. This is a state that could gain a district in redistricting. Uh, or not gain a district. It's a state that Republicans have a good opportunity to uh, gain additional seats in from redistricting. Currently the map is a 7-2 to two, uh, Republican majority. Um, it's a pretty strong majority, and they were able to fend off a challenge in one of the congressional districts from a Democratic candidate who was actually favored to win for quite a while. So uh, Republicans may be a little bit more optimistic about their chances of uh, pushing a more aggressive map, assuming some certain factors we'll talk about later uh, turn out to be the case. So Armin, uh, do you have any thoughts on Indiana, uh, the state of what this race or what this uh, looks like and what we can expect going forward? I mean, yeah. So uh, generally speaking, you have the blue collar cities that are turning more Republican and then you have the white collar suburbs and white collar cities that are turning more democratic. And I mean, given that the Indiana GOP is in a very strong position to draw the maps, they can definitely use the, the power of their gerrymanders to try and stop some of those democratic gains. So it'll be interesting to see what they actually do. I'm sure, I mean, I have a set of ideas for what they could do. Um, I'm sure Eric, you have yours and I'm sure all of us, we have ours as well. So I'm excited to see what, uh, what everyone does. Yeah, for sure. And so, uh, as I said earlier, uh, Harrison will be on in a little bit and we may have some other guests, uh, on as well, but, um, we're going to go ahead and kind of jump into the baseline of what we're looking at here. So, uh, obviously Indiana has a Republican trifecta, which means the legislature is controlled by Republicans and also there's a Republican governor. So even if uh, the governor vetoes the map which is unlikely given the general you know, Republican nature of the state, um, they could still be passed over him in, in, you know, in the legislature, although I don't believe it's a supermajority. I, I believe it's just a Republican straight-up majority. So if for some reason there's a complaint about the districts, that could potentially be a problem, but it's usually not an issue at all. Um, and so the rules that, uh, that are relied on in Indiana are, you know, um, they're pretty similar. Um, there's not been a lot of litigation in Indiana, um, it's a state that's had a pretty stable majority for a while now, this decade. The, the current map is kind of a soft Republican gerrymander. It's certainly compact in a lot of ways, but it is drawn to sort of maximize Republican strength, Even although given the solidly Republican lean of Indiana at this point, it'd be difficult to draw anything otherwise. Um, so going forward, the expectation will be, of course, that Republicans do draw uh, you know, not only favorable legislative maps, but also a more favorable congressional map. Whether or not they add an additional seat, they'll almost certainly be trying to shore up places like the 5th Congressional District, uh, which they were able to win this cycle, but they did face a spirited, you know, challenge um, in, in that contest, um, which is, it's a suburban seat that kind of stretches from um, from uh, Marion County, which is the home, or uh, from uh, Marion County, which is home of Indianapolis, to uh, Hamilton County and some other Indianapolis suburbs. Um, so I'll go ahead and kind of show you the, what we're talking about when we talk about the congressional districts here. Um, go ahead and share my screen here, or set it up so I can do that. I have a new computer here, so I've got to make sure everything is set up properly to do this. Oh, crap. All right, so let's pull this up right here. There we go. This showing up for you? Yeah. All right, perfect. So uh, this is the current congressional map in Indiana. Um, you'll notice right here um, it's nine congressional districts. They're not really numbered in a in an order. You'll notice kind of one, two, three, four, five look fine. Six, seven, then eight and nine are kind of unusual here. Uh, the first district takes in a lot of the more Democratic areas like Gary and Lake County in particular. Um, this district has become more Republican in a bit, or this has become more Republican as of late as northern Indiana has shifted. But it's still a pretty solidly Democratic seat. The second takes in South Bend and a lot of other Republican-leaning areas around it. It's not a, really a competitive district, um, although obviously— It was about 10 years ago. ago. Yeah, 10 years ago, very competitive seat. Now, uh, as northern Indiana has become more competitive, and in fact St. Joseph County has become quite competitive, it's become more difficult for Democrats to win. The third is based around Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, which has actually become a little bit more democratic as of late, but it's not enough to even make the seat remotely competitive. Uh, right. The fourth is based again. The fourth and fifth, or sorry, the fourth and sixth are pretty much kind of similar. Uh, they're based kind of around the. They start around the core of Indianapolis suburbs, 
and then expand into rural areas. Um, very Republican seats, uh, as we'll explain later. The eighth is, in theory, one of the more Democratic seats because it has a t- Vigo or Vigo County, home of Terre Haute, as well as Evans Vander uh, Vanderburg County, home of Evansville. Um, two Democratic leaning areas as of late, although both of them have become much more Republican uh, compared to years prior. Finally, the ninth takes in some areas around Louisville, Kentucky, those uh, suburban areas, as well as Bloomington, which is one of the more Democratic counties in the state. Um, so That's where Indiana University, Indiana University is, right? Yep, Indiana University is based in Bloomington. Uh, Vigo County is on Indiana State University. So if you're familiar with the Sycamores, would be their team, uh, the basketball team with Larry Bird. Um, those are kind of, as you can tell from that, that, pretty close to each other. So these representatives are changing as of the most recent election. I'll kind of show you what the results were from the previous race. Uh, in the first, a longtime incumbent, Pete Vislowski, had kind of had a lock on the seat, based again in the region, as it's known, uh, around the Chicago uh, area. It's hard to call really Lake County a suburb at this point, but it is grouped with the Chicago metropolitan area. As you can see, pretty Democratic district, although it's become more competitive as of late. Uh, if the Wikipedia numbers are accurate, you'll notice a pretty star- sharp drop-off in Democratic support uh, in the district, although it's still quite you know Democratic as a whole. Uh, Jackie Walorski in the second, she has a pretty strong hold on things in that district, again based in St. Joseph County. Uh, Jim Banks is in the third, as you can see right there. You know it's a very uh, very Republican district based in Fort Wayne. Really did no, you know no risks at all. Uh, Jim Baird in the fourth, based out of Green Cap, again a very very Republican district, and he won his reelection with two thirds of the vote. Hard to get much better than than that in a lot of it. You know in these white working class areas. Uh, the fifth is interesting. Susan Brooks retired going into this election, creating an open seat. And so what that ultimately meant was that there was a primary between multiple candidates. The winner was ultimately Victoria Sparks, a state senator. Uh, she's an immigrant from Ukraine. Uh, she immigrated to the United States, and she is known as a pretty strong conservative, especially on fiscal issues. Um, her staunch conservatism was kind of seen to be a negative in the race. Uh, Christina Hale, the Democratic nominee, had support from a lot of liberal organizations, but also more moderate sorts of Democrats, and it was kind of assumed the race would be competitive. We had the race that leans Democratic going into the election, but ultimately Victoria Spars was able to pull out a four-point win here, even as Marion County turned decidedly against Republicans at pretty much all levels, especially the northern portion that is in the district. Uh, Greg Pence, the brother of Mike Pence, represents the sixth, based out of Columbus. Uh, Andre Carson represents the Indianapolis-based district. It's in the 11th. Uh, Indianapolis and Marion County are the same thing. Uh, it's a consolidated city county, uh, which means that his seat is entirely based in the county, although I believe it has a smaller municipality uh, speedway. Uh, a decade ago, the seat was actually quite competitive. It was drawn to be competitive, and it had a competitive race in 2006 of all years. In fact, I'll kind of show you it because it's one of the more interesting uh, contests is kind of this urban-suburban you know, divide right here. Um, it, back then it wasn't, known, it's the seventh right here. You'll notice, um, you know, pretty solid, you know, based around Indianapolis, core urban area back then, much more moderate than now. And, uh, Julia Carson only won reelection by around seven points in a really good year for Democrats. But since then, Indianapolis has become much more democratic and much more, uh, favorable to the democratic party. So Carson, uh, one of only a handful of Muslim members of Congress, um, is, uh, a decided favorite and has no issue of losing here ever. In fact, the seat may only get more Democratic in the future. The eighth, uh, Larry Bouchon, based out of Newburgh. Um, again, this used to be a more competitive district. The eighth district, in fact, is used to be known as the Bloody Eighth. Uh, it's kind of coming to the news lately, as, as right. you will notice, um, because of the uh, controversy that's come out. Rita Hart, the representative from Iowa Second, has decided to skip. Uh, well, the, to the court self-styled the representative. She, yeah, self-styled. She's. She is trying to get the House of Representatives to seat her, even though she seems to have lost the election by six votes. That happened in 1984 in Indiana, and Republicans were angry. Republicans were so angry. You have people like Olympia Snow pledging revenge. Maybe the only time in her life that Olympia Snow has pledged revenge against anyone or anything. Um, so it was definitely uh, death, but that all started back in this bloody 8th district that used to be very competitive and now is not competitive at all. Finally, the ninth, uh, Troy, uh, or Trey uh, Hollingsworth, uh, based in Jeffersonville, again, Louisiana suburbs. Uh, very, very Republican district, even though it does have Bloomington. In fact, I'll go ahead and show you the presidential election results here. Um, um, 
because they are interesting. Um, Indiana did see a little bit of a swing away from Trump, even though Mike Pence is on the ticket, and you can kind of see where. Um, their Wikipedia map is accurate. I looked this up earlier. Uh, you know, tr uh, Biden, basically the Democratic basis of support, 60 to 70 percent in Marion County and in Bloom uh, Bloomington, which again, yeah. look at all the red around it. It really doesn't matter. And then finally, um, you've got other ones, you know, around here, some other scattered uh, areas that are a little bit more Democratic, like Lake County, like St. Joseph, and like this county right here, which I can't recall, but it is more competitive for Democrats. Yeah, Tippecanoe County. Um, uh, I don't know if there's a Tyler County in Indiana, but, um, uh, but uh, just a, a joke. There, but, um, but yeah, so that's kind of the situation we're looking at in Indiana, the current situation. And so uh, I, I want to go to something that Jackson mentioned in the comments, Jackson Bryman, who's a friend of Elections Daily. Um, uh, the only Democrat, the only Republican part of Marion County, oddly enough, is in the seventh. I think they thought that they could make a more competitive Indianapolis-based seat by including that portion in there, similar to 2006. But that thought quickly kind of went away as as Indian as you know Marion County and Indianapolis have pretty much stayed where they were. The seat's not really competitive. It's not, um, it, it wasn't ever going to be competitive under this new map, and so you'll likely see a shift, regardless of what the election what they decide to do, of moving those northern Marion County suburbs into the 7th District and adding the southern ones, which are the more Republican portion, into other congressional districts. I think all of our maps are going to reflect that. So with that out of the way, do you think we kind of want to jump into showing what our maps look like here? Or, um, or yeah. any other thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, so oh. all, all I was going to say is just it's a testament to how much the coalitions have changed that now the 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 second was initially the competitive democratic leading seat at the beginning of the decade and the the ninth was the competitive republican leading seat and neither of those are on the board anymore and then the fifth which was drawn as a safe republican pack in the suburbs is uh, you know there was a real race for it in 2020 so uh yeah it's worth noting um hamilton county which is entirely in that district uh, is the only county in Indiana that trended to the left from 2008 to 2016, which you may say, that's kind of weird. Um, what does that mean? Well, keep in mind, in 2008, Indiana voted for Barack Obama. It actually voted for him by a larger margin than states like North Carolina did. Uh, it was a pretty surprising performance. And as we've mentioned, as we have an article on this, a brilliant article um, from uh, our contributor, Harrison Griffiths, explained why this happened. Um, but, Part of the reason why is places, the suburban areas around Indianapolis stayed pretty red, including Hamilton County. Since then, right, Carmel Obama just... And other areas... Oh, at Carmel, Fishers, Noblesville, yeah. Yeah, these have, the, these have all trended to the left since 2016, or 28, 2008, whereas even Marion County saw a slight shift to the right from 2008 to 2016. Keep in mind, the state shifted to the right. So it's kind of significant to see a county like Hamilton become more democratic and become more competitive. And so I think our maps will reflect that. Uh, I think I'll go ahead and show my map first since mine's a really simple one. It, it's kind of a basic uh, – it's – well, it's a probably a legal gerrymander, but there may be some issues uh, in some ways with the map. So uh, this is a pretty nasty congressional map that I've drawn, uh, as you can see right here. Um, one thing to look at is, of course, that I drew the seat. It goes from Gary to Indianapolis. Um, and it kind of just draws in nothing in between. You may be wondering why it stretches so far down rather than just connecting through here. There's a reason why. This is an incumbent protection gerrymander. I wanted to ensure all incumbents were safe in their districts and would not only not face a risk of a Democrat, but also a risk of a primary challenger. So let's start with District 1, um, which is uh, obvious. Or, yeah, so District 1 uh, previously is based in Lake County, and it's just all of Lake County along with some areas through here. Instead, this new district uh, stretches from Lake County all the way along to the border of, with Ohio. Um, the result is a district that's very Republican, as you can see um, on the map right here. Uh, it's Republican plus, 12, or plus 11 from 2012 to 2016, and on average would have voted for Republicans by around 20 percentage points. Uh, even in 2008, it would have voted for Republicans by around 1 percentage point. So this is a district that Republicans would probably have no issue holding at all. The second, uh, again, is the St. Joseph-based one, contains some of these areas that are already in the first district, but have become more Republican. As I showed you earlier, some of these counties in between St. Joseph and Lake have become uh, more Republican, which means the district is more Republican. 
like this one. It's around uh, R plus 11. Uh, it's a district that would have been won by Republicans in 2008. And it's a district that would be won by Republicans by around 20 points on average. The third uh, is probably the most similar to the old district. Uh, it's very Republican. It's a little bit more Republican than average. I made it so because I wanted the district to be safe against a Democratic presence growing in Fort Wayne. Uh, Fort Wayne is one of the few areas where Joe Donnelly actually did pretty well. He actually improved in the 20, uh, 6, 2018 Senate election in Indiana. He did a pretty solid job in, 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 uh, in Fort Wayne. So I wanted to make that a little bit more safe. The fourth is, uh, is gross. Um, the incumbent obviously lives in the center of this county right here. So the map was drawn to basically keep a lot of his seat safe. It draws in parts of Lake County along with some of the more strongly held suburban areas of, uh, of you know, Indianapolis. So if you look at the kind of the way it's drawn right here, you'll notice these are all very red. The parts it takes in pr here are pretty blue, and it kind of cuts off along some of the bluer areas up through here. The result is a seat that would have voted for, uh, obviously, Republicans in 2000, uh, 2008. Also would vote for them by around 17 points now. It's probably safe enough, um, but this could be a risk, a calculated risk for sure. Uh, the fifth uh, is a little bit different. Uh, Victoria Spars lives in Marion in Hamilton County. I believe she lives in Fishers. So I included a little bit of... I thought it was Noblesville, but either way, oh, yeah. Noblesville. Either one, yeah. She lives in the county, basically. And all of Hamilton County is in the district. So this district would have voted for Republicans, as you'll notice here, by a very large margin in 2008. 14 percentage points. A very strong performance. Uh, 2012 to 2016 will be around 63%. This is probably sufficiently safe to prevent any challengers. And the portion of Marion County that's in here is not only pretty small, it's also fairly Republican, even to this, to this point. It's not seen that complete wipeout, but it's also not a lot of voters. I mean, if I were to remove the Marion County portion right here, uh, it's only 93,000 people. That's not a lot. That's not enough to really substantially sway the district. Uh, the sixth, uh, is a, definitely a, a risk as well, but it's these suburbs aren't really changing. The southern suburbs around Indianapolis uh, has Plainfield, it has Speedway, it has southern areas of Marion County. You notice again, I'll show the map right here. It cuts off of basically where the Republicans start to exist in Marion County at this point. And this is a very Republican seat. Would have been Republican plus 12 in 2008 and would have voted for Republicans with around 63%. Uh, finally, uh, the most exciting one of these is the 7th. Um, so this is a horrendous district. Uh, it's barely legal, if it's legal at all. Um, it, there, you could make a case this is a VRA-packed district. It's actually majority non-white, which is fairly difficult to do in Indiana. Uh, you know, Democrats would have won this with 76% of the vote uh, in 2008. But you'll notice right here, uh, they would actually have lost a share of the vote. They would only be winning this one by around 75 to 25 uh, from the 2012 to 2016 election. So even though this is a Democratic district, obviously it has a lot of areas that have shifted to the right um, and also has a lot of rural areas that I include just one precinct each and then stretched around through areas right here to um, you know, to kind of make this uh, disgusting monstrosity. It also obviously includes all the Democratic portions of Marion County. Like it literally just cuts off right where the Democratic portions stop being Democratic. Um, so Andre Carson would have no difficulty winning this, given uh, he's African American. This is a plurality uh, white seat, but the predominant Democratic voting base here would be African American. It'd be hard to see a white Democrat like the one elected in the first district being elected in this district. Uh, so really, it probably doesn't change. And you know, the core voter base of the district, if I cut this out, show you how much it is. It's Marion County. Uh, Two thirds of the district lives in the Marion County portion of the seat. So really, the dominant force would be um, would be Andre Carson, who would be very, very safe again. Uh, the eighth, uh, there's really not a whole lot you need to change here because the district's very safe. This is one that would have voted for uh, for Republicans by around six percentage points last time, uh, 2008, and would have voted for them by around 30 points now. So not really much to say here. And then finally, uh, the ninth district right here, as you'll notice, uh, again, 60-40 district, would have voted for John McCain by a pretty substantial margin. So what does that look like if you look at the overall you know, picture of the district? So let's turn on our partisan lean right here, turn off county lines. I may have to reboot the map to, to kind of show you what it looks like without the county lines. Um, aside from the 7th, the map doesn't look that horrible. I mean, the 7th and the 1st are pretty ugly, but the rest of them don't look that awful. 
but the seventh is is a disgust is a disgusting monstrosity. Also shade at two thousand eight. Again, an achievement here I think is that even though Barack Obama would have won the state of Indiana, he would have lost every congressional district other than the seventh, which I think is a fairly major accomplishment. I wasn't intending to draw it that way, but drawing this massive vote sink uh, really did cause it to look like that. Finally, let's look at the composite here. Um, yeah, I mean. There's really not a whole lot to say here. This is very, very, very red. Uh, Republicans would have a pretty safe time you know, winning in this district. So let's look at the analytics right here. What does it think about, what does Dave's redistricting think about my map? Well, it really thinks it's a great minority representation map and it's pretty terrible for pretty much everything else. Um, Indiana is obviously a very Republican state at this point. Uh, Democrats are lucky to have a competitive race in the state as a whole, let alone win any races. So expecting a, a lot of districts beyond just the two they have is expecting a lot. Um, but even then, uh, this is just not a fair map at all. It actually gets a zero for proportionality and a two for competitiveness. I'm not sure where that 2% comes from because um, really none of these districts are competitive at all. But yeah, uh, that's my map. Do you have any thoughts about it, uh, Armin? Uh, you know, I, it's, it's evil, but it works. <laughs> it, I mean, it, it's 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 a it's a good gerrymander. That's that's very impressive. You managed to make Obama pull a Doug Jones while he wins the state with only a single congressional district. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, it's similar to what we saw in in Alabama, right, where Roy Moore was able to win six out of seven congressional districts in the state while losing the state to Doug Jones by a narrow margin. Right. Um, yeah. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Jackson said congratulations for the zero. Thank you, Jackson. I'm very proud of that. That was exactly <laughs> what I was going for with this congressional map. Um, yeah. Um, but no, yeah, uh, that's – that's... Yeah, I was just going to say – I tried all sorts of combinations. I tried all sorts oh. of combinations. I specifically tried making a map where, um, where uh, Lake County was not in the Marion County District. I tried splitting Lake County up in kind of like snake-like tendrils throughout the state. I just found it to be way too difficult. It didn't actually work. And the result was that districts that were way too competitive for my taste. Drawing that little tendril from Gary to, uh, to Indianapolis really makes this map kind of impossible for Democrats to win in. There's really not a whole lot of seats here that they can, you know, look at and be, you know, say to themselves, we can win this district. Um, uh, welcome Harrison to, to joining on. I'm, I'll go ahead and show him this map I made real quick just before we hop, throw it off. Yeah, the thanks. Happy to be here. Uh, yeah, I, I saw uh, this map earlier in the DRA chat. Yep. Uh, obviously, as we mentioned before, uh, very, very Republican. It got a zero on proportionality from Dave's redistricting app. It's something I'm quite proud of. Yeah, it looks obviously, fair to me. Yeah, it's extremely, you know, all that red. You know, Indiana is a red state, and obviously a fair map is a map that has as much red as possible. Um, so I hope I tried to reflect that in my, in my map drawing. I mean, that's always a good strategy as much red as possible. Yeah. I tried, I pulled it reverse. Uh, Armin, did you draw a map today? Yeah, I drew two. Uh, I, I don't know if you already showed them. It's fine. You don't have to show them again, but. No, I'm the only one that showed maps so far. Oh, okay. We were going over the redistricting rules. We were going over the current representatives, some other, you know, some other stuff that had been involved. The most recent elections, obviously, where we made a, we made a goof in our prediction for the fifth district. I think pretty much everyone did. Um, yeah, well, everyone screwed up the house, so I'm not going to hold it yeah. against us. Yeah. I mean, I'm just I'm, happy I'm about. Happy got... Yeah, I'm happy with what we got right. We got NY Oklahoma 11, five, Carol... New York eleven, yeah. and Minnesota seven right, and then we had a lot of things like keeping Texas twenty two as Republican, for example, that proved to be correct. So I'm happy about right. that. Troy. Troy. <laughs> okay, Armin, do you want to go? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, so yeah, I drew. Uh, what I would do if I was Curtis Hill from jail trying to draw the gerrymandered map of Indiana. <laughs> uh, uh, and then I drew... Uh, yeah, I mean, Jonathan Weinzapel did pretty well for a Democrat in Indiana. I mean, he didn't win, yeah. but he still did pretty well. It's because Todd Rokita, or Todd Rokita is extremely not liked among state Republicans. Um, oh, I mean, he went through that brutal Senate primary, remember, yeah. against Braun and yeah. Messer? That, that's one of those classic primaries where you have two representatives shooting themselves in the foot together, collectively screwing themselves over and allowing yeah. uh, that outsider like Mike Braun to come in and just win the primary. Not to be the best candidate. I mean, to be honest, Rokita is just 
he's not only not liked by other state Republicans, he's just honestly not that likable. Like, Republicans in the party are not fans of him. That's why Democrats thought they had an opening in the AG race, even though they ultimately didn't. Yeah. Right, yeah. No, yeah. If if the polls in Indiana were actually as close as they said that it should have been, then yeah, it, w- it would have been a fairly close-ish race. Um, but yeah, my, sec- my second map is what I personally would do in my assessment of what a proportional map for Indiana would be that reflects proper political geography. Yeah. Oh, Jackson's um, talking about Eisen Gabe. Hi, Jackson. Thank you for watching. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, I mean, honestly, we, we joke about it, but I mean, there's people on both sides of the aisle who tend to be a little bit dismissive. You know, I mean, I had a nice conversation with Eisen Gabe the other, the other day. I, I, he's he's all right. He, he's, I, I don't have I don't have an issue with RRH. I don't no, have an issue with no, him. I don't either. I, RRH made good content. Like I liked when they were calling out the hypocrisy of Stephen Wolf and DKE. Oh, I don't pay attention to Stephen Wolf's maps. I don't have an issue with anyone on this platform aside from people who are trying no, yeah. using their platform to try and disguise things as fact that are not. Like for example, presenting an Iowa map which packs as many Republicans as possible in the fourth district and is like, oops, I guess they're all in the fourth district. That means all the other ones are Democratic. Like. That one is a bit absurd. Well, they, they won't be for much longer with the way Iowa is going. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. If, you know, if only we could draw districts, uh, like, for example, if we could draw some of West Texas in the same district as districts in New Jersey, for example. Then, like, we could... <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, very, that's very funny. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll sh- pull it up for you. Okay, so uh, here is my Republican gerrymander. Oh, uh, good job. Looks wow. nice. So I tried to make it a little less patently obnoxious. Um, but, um, yeah, so why don't we just go district by district? So this first district here, uh, if, you, if you turn on the county lines, this is Lake County, and this is, I believe it's Porter County. Yeah, it is. Um, mm-hmm. And so rather than destroying this first district outright like you did, I mean, Biden underwhelmed a lot. Like he underwhelmed, like with the, and he really underperformed in this district. So my my philosophy was, I'm just going to let this district take a bunch of red rules in here that are eventually going to surge with another Trump like figure on the ballot. And you know, Gary is weakening in terms of how democratic it's been. Mervan's a strong guy, but he can't hold that forever. And so this district here, as you can see, the current Indiana's first. Uh, Lake swung very right. Uh, Porter swung slightly Democratic, and Laporte swung more to the right. So yeah, Mervan would probably be out in that seat in 2022. Yeah, no, and as you can see, the current seats PVI is D plus eight. This is D plus one yeah. with all of these rules here. So you know, this is a pretty weak. Uh, you know, this is a very strong weakening of the seat for Democrats. If I'm trying to gerrymander and. Uh, you know, you don't have to make the map look really ugly in the process. So then two uh, is the next seat here. Um, so I, I actually, in order to crack this residual Democratic strength here, I wanted to put it with Fort Wayne, which has been moving left somewhat, but it's still a ton of votes and they're still heavily Republican. And as we've seen, con- congressional trends lag about uh, two cycles or so behind presidential trends. So this this should last a decade. I mean, it's R plus nine. Uh, you know, this this stuff is definitely trending right faster than this is trending left. Um, and uh, I believe the incumbent in this seat is Jim Banks. He lives in Columbia City, right on the edge of his, of the district there. Um, so, yeah, that's another probably safe Republican seat. So then the third one becomes uh, this thing, uh, which is this. It's kind of the successor to the old second. It's got South Bend, Elkhart in it as well as part of Marshall and all of Kosciuszko County. And then these rural counties here, which are really, really red. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, as you can see, R plus 13, super safe Republican. And There's, no, Buttigieg would not be able to win that seat. For any yeah, Buttigieg yeah, Buttigieg, Buttigieg would get... Buttigieg is never winning that seat. That is a yeah, good it's too Buttigieg, Republican. Buttigieg would get smacked and then rolled over with a yeah. tank in the seat. It would make his his run, I think, his treasurer. Yeah, his treasurer run would make it oh, he, an easy, easy defeat. Yeah, no, he'd, he'd do worse in this district than he did the last time when he ran for treasurer, too, just because, I mean, the rules have gotten redder. But yeah, where but he doesn't really fit in with that district, to be honest, even even though it has South Bend in it, if you're looking at the district. I mean, look, 
like maybe what did he have good name wreck in? South Bend and Elkhart. Okay, yeah, so the, granted, point is the rest of those are really red. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah, granted, even, yeah. Even even St. Joseph County itself, which is pretty used to be pretty, you know, fairly democratic, is actually, it's now a toss up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, the most recent election, you know, 2016, it was only decided by under 200 votes. Um, right. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's made, had a massive rightward turn since tw- uh, 2008. Right. Yeah. So uh, that was three. So I hate Jim to say, but Indiana is one of those states with a bunch of backbencher Republicans that I forget about. Going to be honest. <laughs> Right, yeah. So, I think uh, Pence would be more notable, but he's not. Yeah, most of, most of these states, I have their congressional delegations memorized, but Indiana is just one of those. A lot like Tennessee has a lot of freshman backbench Republicans. You kind of just forget about them. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, then you have four, which uh, is the Jim Baird seat, uh, and he's in Putnam County. He's got some of Hamilton and a bunch of rules here. He has Terre Haute as well. Um, I mean, Terre Haute's now red enough that it doesn't, it's not as much of a democratic powerhouse as it was anyway, yeah. and it's I got the it's, it's democratic roots. It's pretty solid. Yeah, I mean, all of southern Indiana has really, but but yeah, especially Vigo. Then you have five, um, and Victoria Sparts lives in Noblesville, which I made sure to draw, but um, five stops at the ha- at the Hamilton Marion line. It doesn't go into Marion, um, and then it takes a bunch of these you know more uh, rural areas here. I believe Kokomo is in here. Um, uh, Kokomo is a mid-sized city, but it's still really red. I mean, this is an R plus sixteen PVI. Um, so, I mean, if you if you look at the the shift here, so yeah, some, Hamilton's shifted very Democratic, but the rest of these, you know, Blackford, J. I mean, I don't know about any of this, but they barely budged. So this district is uh, still going to be very Republican. Um, and as you can see, the composite here is. R plus 30. Um, so then six is this green one, which takes in Southern Marion because that's the red part. Uh, and then Greg Pence, who's Mike Pence's brother, he lives in Columbus, which is in Bartholomew County. And then, you know, just these rural East Central Indiana counties, super safe Republican, R plus 30 again. So nothing too crazy to say there. Um, so then seven, uh, I basically switch out the the suburban part of Marion uh, from south to north and basically make the district a tiny bit bluer. What is the current PVI of the 7th? Okay, it's D plus 11. So yeah, this becomes D plus 17 when you take out southern Marion and put in a lot of these northern Marion uh, suburbs. Andre Carson is going to be fine here and Victoria Sparks doesn't have to worry about any potential primary challengers because Hamilton, it's trending leftwards, but it's still very red. Uh, she doesn't have anything to worry about here. Uh, so then, as Eric mentioned, the bloody eighth, although it's really not that bloody anymore because it's just safe Republican. Well, it's um, that it's very red. Yeah, yeah, I suppose, yeah. Um, this is, again, just the Southwest Indiana seat. Um, there's nothing really to say about it. I mean, it has IU at Bloomington here, but that's maybe like 20% of the district. The rest is really red. And, you know, has been for some time. I mean, this is where southern Indiana is where all of the butternut Democrats who, you know, are extremely conservative on fiscal and social issues. uh, You know, this is the area where they're from and the National Democratic Party just doesn't work for them anymore. So they're all Republicans now. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then finally, we have nine, which is R plus 18 somehow it's redder than eight um but yeah this goes all the way to the southern exurbs of indianapolis and then takes in the southeastern part of the butternut areas floyd clark harrison you know 10 years ago you know you know 2008 baron hill would have done quite okay i'm not sure what that is baron hill would have done quite well um but uh nowadays this this area is completely out of reach i mean Scott County had state representative Terry Gooden, who is one of the last, uh, you know, butternut Democrats in the legislature, and he lost by double digits. So, you know, this area is utterly inhospitable for Democrats. So, uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, um, why don't we take a look at exactly how this is going to look with the live on Mars? Hmm? It's like trying to live on Mars now, trying to be a Democrat there. (laughs) Yeah, basically. So, yeah, as you can see. This one is extremely weak in terms of PVI. 
I mean, this two is competitive-ish, but I wouldn't sweat it. And then there's a seven, and everything else is just really red. So there's really not a chance. the 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 di- The difference with your map and mine, Eric, is that on on mine, Obama actually won four of these seats. But this coalition, you know, with the way trends are going, it's it's a pretty safe bet that this is not going to be replicated for a very long time. So. Uh, you know, even even if this eighth and the second somehow dummy man, I don't I don't think that would happen. So, uh, yeah, uh, analytics wise, why don't we take a look? So here is the here is the partisan lean. I mean, you see this this first one isn't even a safe Democratic seat anymore. Um, then you have uh, I was good on splitting; it was fairly compact and apparently good for minority rights, even though I basically destroyed. The influence of people in Hammond and uh, Valparaiso. I can tell you, my my map's not going to be good for minority rights because I drew out Andre Carson, even though that's not a VRA seat still. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And then advanced, I don't know, you people make it. I mean, yeah, none of these seats are actually competitive except for that first. And that's going to, that this is going to turn into 8 1 fairly soon unless uh, Frank Mervan turns into a Republican. And even then, it still might. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Here, here's the first map. What are you, what are y'all's thoughts? He just needs to go talk with Troy. <laughs> well, for I, I like your map. It's very interesting. The only qualm I have really is, personally, I'm pretty sure Indiana Republicans are going to try and get it to the point where they have, uh, maybe one likely Republican seat, but as many safe seats as possible. So I would think they would just try and draw it to the point where there would only be really one Democratic seat, whereas your one could still theoretically be won by a Democrat. Yeah. But, but I like well, the map overall. Yeah. I actually thought the, the scenario where they draw a second Democratic district is where they draw from Gary to uh, to South Bend. That's actually, yeah. what I, that's actually what I did on my map. That is, yeah, that is indeed another option. Uh, I mean, I thought about that, but then that involves just drawing it all the way here and you have to split too many counties. And I said, I mean, these guys are conservatives anyway. Like it's not like they need Democrats that much anymore. Um, so yeah. Uh, shall, shall we go on to map number two? Yep, go, for yeah, it. go ahead. All right. So uh, here is map number two. This is what I, th- this is what my attempt at a fair ish looking map of Indiana would be with, with nine districts. So uh, yeah, why don't we why don't we take a gander? So I mean, the first here has uh, Lake, and, and so this is a combination of uh, political geography, communities of interest, and competitiveness in, in some uh, things. So the first one here is D plus six. Uh, it's got Lake Porter, and then some rurals in here as well. I mean, you know, maybe I shouldn't do that, but it makes the district a tiny bit more competitive and as i've said before if they don't like it they could scream uh mervan would probably win this district um the second one it's it's a slightly more competitive than the current second but again elkhart and kosciusko and marshall are really really red and kind of are there what puts the district out of reach for a democrat i mean laporte and 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 saint joseph are still quite competitive uh, so Walorski would probably be fine in this. Uh, Pete Buttigieg, he wouldn't get absolutely exterminated like in the other South Bend district, but he would very likely lose badly. Um, then the third uh, becomes this giant eastern Indiana wall seat that's centered in Fort Wayne. Um, yeah, Fort Wayne's more than half of the seat's population, um, and it just basically hugs a bunch of rurals outside of that. Uh, so then the, the reason I, the way I drew these middle Indiana seats was, uh, so why don't I go with the Metro first? So uh, seven is obviously Northern Marion and then five and six, I wanted to try and contain the Indy Metro in as few seats as possible. And I can't do that in one. So I decided to do it in two and Greg Pence gets Columbus in his sixth and Sparks gets her fifth here. So basically the, the Indianapolis suburban donut ring is covered in two districts, which is nice. And R plus 15, R plus 19. They're both super safe and nothing is ever going to bother them because Hamilton's trending red, but the rest of these are not, and they're still really red. So, you know, Republicans have nothing to worry about there. This fourth then just becomes a, a pretty much purely rural seat. Uh, I mean, it's got Lafayette, it's got Kokomo, but the rest of it is, you know, 
farms and corn and things like that. Um, and again, super safe Republican. Uh, and we did seven already. So then eight and nine, these are the butternut seats as well. Uh, minimal county splitting, but uh, eight has Terre Haute. And uh, yeah, it basically takes in Evansville, Terre Haute, and all of the southwestern, you know, culturally southern rural areas in between. Uh, this is Larry Duchamp's seat, and it's, again, super safe Republican. Nine, it's got IU, Bloomington, and uh, it's got some s sort of bluing Louisville suburbs, but they, they're not bluing fast enough. And then these areas here, Switzerland, Ohio, Jefferson, all of these are really, really red. So Trey Hollingsworth is going to be fine here. So um, when you look at this map... Uh, when you look at the partisan lean, you see one, two, and then you have, a, again, a slightly competitive South Bend seat. Uh, it's just that the, the, the communities of interest are at least a bit better represented here than they were on the Republican gerrymander. And then Obama-wise, he won the South Bend seat, which you know is now kind of a, a miracle when you think about it these days. Um, and then uh, the rest, you know, these are all pretty safely Republican. And, you know, it's really a sign of how things have changed that the eighth was uh, less red than the fifth and the sixth, and especially the third, which were all anchored by big, you know, urban areas, much, much more so than the eighth is and the ninth and the fourth as well. But uh, no, yeah, this would this 10 years ago, Terry Gooden would have had a great shot at this ninth. But uh, now it's now it, it's it's sadly too far gone. But uh, yeah, yeah, this is the. This is the map. I mean, I had to draw a tendril into Muncie just for extra population. And uh, I pretty much took just the city and nothing else around it. But, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. I mean, Muncie is a city like that. And this is a predominantly rural district outside of Fort Wayne. So that was that was my thought process, my decision making there. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's not really much notable about Muncie other than it's the home of Garfield. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, yeah. That that is my second map. Mm, looks reasonable. I mean, again, it, for Democrats wanting a third district here, it's it's not happening. It would no, yeah, there's, there's no real. You have to draw like Vigo to Bloomington to. Maine. No, yeah, there there's no real way to do it. When, when when I say a fair map, that means I try not to draw a map that you know pours gasoline on treads. And this map, by keeping a lot of northern Indiana whole and not you know split between other areas does that to some degree in the event that a rick sacone tier republican comes then you know perhaps joe donnelly has a brother somewhere that could be running in that second district mm -hmm. but yeah i believe that is that is all i have for me oh i was on mute i was saying i like oh, that. oh okay yeah thanks harrison I guess I'll share mine. I drew it a little while ago on a video call, actually, but let me pull it up real quick. I did take the strategy of drawing a seat from Gary to South Bend to be the sole Democratic seat, and this would basically be the Frank Mervan seat. Uh, so uh, basically to start up here, uh, as you can see, I drew Gary and South Bend into the same district, which is the second district would be the Frank Mervan seat. Uh, the trends have been good for the Republicans here, especially in Northwest Indiana. And uh, as Armin said earlier, Gary is not getting any bluer, and it's, it's pretty evident when you population. I mean, it's, it's a, that it's that as well. I mean, a good it's, way it's to a very sad location. To die, well, to when you look, city. well, when you look at it, you can see uh, how it shifted towards the right, at least slightly, if you compare the composite from the last two presidential elections, or I guess the last three. Now that we have had a new one. Uh, against 2008, there was an improvement for Republicans there and also a drop in voter turnout. So this would be the district of Frank Mervan, heavily white. Uh, do you have a con contingency of an African-American population in Gary uh, and also in South Bend? But overall, the district is still majority white. It's still Democrat plus 10. So this, again, would be a district that Frank Mervan would probably have a pretty good shot at winning. If the trends keep going like they're um, going now. The seat could theoretically be competitive. Uh, it depends. I would I would like to get 2016 presidential data here, but I mean, a seat like Kansas too, for example, was close in a blue wave, almost flipped. Uh, Paul Davis, obviously, uh, 
had inroads there against Steve Watkins, but that was a Trump plus 19 seat. So theoretically in a massive Republican wave, if the trends continue, this second could be a seat that could be competitive. So that would be one to watch. But overall, it should be a hold for the Democrats most of the time. Then I drew this first district here. Uh, my first district effectively, if we want to, I should put on the county lines just for reference. The first district effectively takes in the southern parts of Lake Porter and LaPorte County and stretches down to include some of the Republican rules. And overall, this district, as you can see, and we're going to see this as a common theme tonight, was competitive to some extent back in 2008, but it's reliably Republican now, um, looking at the first. So this would be, again, fairly Republican district, does include Elkhart. Uh, Fort Wayne, meanwhile, is in my third district, which is slightly more Republican than the first district. It's about it's about 65% Republican if you look at the composite vote, R plus 16. And this district's larger. It stretches down pretty much down the right spine of the state, the eastern, the eastern spine. Uh, goes up here from the borders of Elkhart and swings down through Fort, Ray, Fort Wayne. Fort Wayne being the largest city, pretty much the only major city in the district. Uh, and then it swings all the way down and about splits it in half at Richmond is where it would stop. Um, then we get to the sixth district below. I went for the classic design of splitting it in half like this rather than having the awkward shaped three district layout that they have in the current map here. Went for the old fashioned block districts. Uh, again, six very reliably Republican territory nowadays. Uh, R plus 17. And uh, seven's actually up there, so I'll get to it in a second. But I'll go to my eighth district. Uh, again, you can see this eighth district was actually won by the Democrats back in 2008. And that's something we just wouldn't see today. Uh, the district has become fairly Republican, as I said again. Uh, R plus 12, if you're looking at current statistics, obviously redder if we look at 20. Uh, 2016 and 2020, once we eventually get that PVI data. Um, I'll go back to four because I drew out Andre Carson by splitting his seat three ways. Uh, and again, I'm sorry, I forgot to relabel all these districts, but I mean, just looking at the map we have now, my fourth district here does include Vigo County, and uh, it also includes parts of Northern Marion County. And the district here is Republican plus five. So my fourth and my seven are both Republican plus five. 0.5 about about that and uh, i guess long term it's a possibility it could become a dummy mander but again i don't really think that's going to happen at least for the first few cycles especially if this is a map that's implemented in the red wave uh which some people are already predicting 2022 to be uh so four and seven definitely seats that are more in the republican nature and it automatically makes this a better map for the republicans considering they've uh, garnered an, an extra advantage of one seat in the delegation by effectively bringing down the Democratic total from two seats to one. And then the Southern seat that takes in more of the rules and also Southern Marion County, actually the bulk of Marion County, is the ninth district here, which as you can see is more Republican. Uh, about 58% of the vote was cast for the Republicans. If you look at the composite, it's about R plus 10, so more Republican than four and seven. So ideally this map should work out to Again, a 8-1 uh, advantage for the Republicans in the delegation, getting rid of Andre Carson and solidifying Frank Mervan. Mm -hmm. And in theory, you could, as with any any state really, you could draw a map where the percentages of the vote perfectly match statewide, but that would just be too much of a risk even for Republicans. That would run the risk of multiple seats flipping. Um, if you're going to do it, you either got to keep Andre Carson or you got to keep Mervan. Yep. Out of the two, Mervan is probably way more moderate than than Carson would be and would have to be in a more modern Yeah, I, I was thinking about it. I mean, it was a fair map when I drew it. I mean, I decided it would be fair to represent the leanings of the state as a whole. That was kind of, that was my intention, essentially. And Frank Mervan, in my opinion, is a better incumbent than Andre Carson. So mm -hmm. that was the seat I was going to keep. Yeah. And obviously uh, a fair map of Indiana, Indiana would look a little bit different. But honestly, again, unless you start doing crazy things like trying to combine Fort Wayne with south bend and other parts of gary are specifically drawing out portions of the rules to into lake county which make no sense at all a compact fair map of indiana probably is a seven to two map for for democrat or for republicans at best um definitely drawing a district even one you know and coming out can make up for for example drawings that happen in illinois or maryland 
So it would be it would be surprising to me if Republicans weren't more aggressive. And the, the Democrats, I feel like, are going to screw up in Illinois. They're going to get ahead of themselves and throw themselves too deep into the pond to get back out again. Because if they draw a map expecting to get rid of Republicans like Rodney Davis, for all we know, they could forget about how to save their other incumbents that had very close races like Lauren Underwood or to another extent, Sherry Bustos, who's really never had a race where she only was held to 52% of the vote, except her very first election. I don't know where Armin went, but yeah. I. But I assume he appreciates the map uh, on an aesthetic level. So. <laughs> yeah. No. I, it was good. Yeah. Sorry, I was busy, but no, it was. A, it was. I appreciate your map. It was very good. No. Yeah. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, those are our just those are our maps we have for, um, for Indiana. Obviously, this is an interesting state. It's a state that's uh, become more conservative as of late and seems to have fallen out of the Democratic column entirely. You could argue the white working class voter collapse of Democrats has hit no Midwestern state harder than it's hit uh, Indiana in terms of you know support. You could maybe count Ohio, but even then, it's still relatively competitive. I mean, Ohio's so, going the way of Indiana. Great. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, Indiana, all you have for Democrats is you have Bloomington, which is a college town. You have, uh, you have um, Indianapolis. You have Gary, which, again, if you're relying on Gary for votes— uh, sorry, you're not going to have that for much longer. Gary is, as is Lake County, a declining municipality, um, literally in population. Um, it's not somewhere people generally are moving to, as opposed to you know other places across the country, like Cincinnati, for example. So it's just in the long term, Indiana is a pretty grim state for Democrats, even with you know the growing strength in Northern Marion and uh, and you know Southern Hamilton counties. So I'd yeah. be shocked if the map is not a seven to one map of some have. And we presented you multiple possibilities of a seven to one map. From I mean, it would be Indiana funny if they tried to overextend themselves with an eight zero map somehow. Yeah. Eight zero would be would be an accomplishment, but again, I don't know how you do that without risking incumbents. I don't know how you do that without having a dummy mander. I'm telling you, they. I mean, effectively, once they get rid of one person, one vote, you could just draw a map where. You could do that, basically. <laughs> well, if the Supreme Court does indeed get rid of one person, one vote, then we really have to redraw our maps. And then we don't have to worry about county splits at all, yeah, we because then redraw. Republicans can just pack all the Democrats into Literally. one giant district that goes from Lake to Marion and, and then just spread the rest out equally. Yeah, but yeah. Um... Uh, does anyone have any thoughts in the comments about uh, the maps? Any questions about Indiana or uh, redistricting in general? We're obviously getting back into the hang of hosting these live podcasts. Our account is back. If you uh, follow us on Twitter at elections underscore daily, uh, we were uh, a little bit absent as a result of some unfair Twitter actions towards our account. But unfair is putting it likely. Yeah, likely. But we're back. And it was a total witch hunt. Yeah, it was a it's, witch hunt. Yeah, it was a it disgrace. Was a, it was a hoax, collusion, uh, fake news. But yeah, they need to stop the count. Yeah, big league. Stop the count. <laughs> but also count the votes at the same time. Yes. <laughs> well, count the votes when it helps Republicans. Stop that's the that's what you always have to do. That's the number one rule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I don't see any. I don't see any activity in the chat. So uh, thank you guys for watching this episode. We'll be back next week with. Uh, what would our next, it would be Iowa. Iowa. Would be our next Iowa. Week. Nice and easy. Yeah. I have a great Republican. I, a sorry, fair map. <laughs> That's going to be a pain <laughs> of a state. And we're going to be discussing, of course, the litigation going on in Iowa's second district. Oh, which gosh. Is into a fiasco and a hellscape. Rita Hart needs to concede. That just shows you that yeah. she can't accept a loss. Yeah. That's not the yeah. character yeah. you need in representative. I, trust me if I say that if she, what she's wanting to happen happens, Republicans will just nuke. All redistricting in Iowa. That, they should. If, if she won't accept a loss and Marionette Miller makes is wrongfully not seated in Congress, then they should just get revenge by drawing. I mean, Rita power. Hart's going to lose in two years anyway. I don't get why she's going so crazy. <laughs> I know. She's going to, I mean, yeah, people like Rita Hart. Well, it doesn't matter. She's Rita Hart Marianne lost. Just like Claudia That's Tenney weird. lost on the opposite end of the spectrum. When you lose a race, you concede. Trump Did she actually Trump. lose? No, I, th I think she's still ahead. No, wait, yeah, no. She, Yes, there were oh, yeah, yeah, I got it. I got it backwards because the last time I checked it was the other way around. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. New York's twenty second is yeah. a mess. I'm seeing some people floating around a trade where Republicans Honestly, get twenty two and Democrats get Iowa too, but they're leading in both. So what would the trade be? 
You get screwed. I don't know. I last time I checked last week, Brindisi was up by thirteen. I think no, I think he's down by like twenty now or something yeah. like that. And there's additional votes that have shown up. Look, I bet you Oneida County is going to find uh, a truck full of ballots. Yeah. So again, thank you guys for watching and have a good night.